Hi, my name is Josh Hageman, and I am coming at you from Fluid Backstage 2014. Uh, I am honored to have in the house today uh, Eugene Cho. Th this guy is a bit of a phenomenon around the world. If you don't know him yet, he is the lead pastor at Quest Church in Seattle, but he's also the director for One Day's Wages. And uh, man, this guy's heart for ministry is just awesome. So Eugene, mm -hmm. welcome to Fluid Backstage. And uh, before we go any further, why don't you tell us just a little bit about uh, what you do in Seattle and kind sure. of what your heart is for the ministry sure. of the Kingdom of God. Well, thanks, Josh. Good to be here. Uh, no phenomena at all. Just uh, humble, lo lo low-key folks. Um, yeah, 43 years old, been living in Seattle for about 17 years. I've uh, been married to my wife for 17 years. She's a marriage and family therapist. So I have to mention that we're happily married. <laughs> and uh, we have three children that are two teenagers and a 10 year old. And um, I think uh, you know, how I spend my time, I pastor a church that I love that we planted 13 years ago. I also run a, a nonprofit community cafe and music venue. Uh, keeps me connected to my neighborhood and my city as well. And uh, we're just trying to live you know, simple lives of hope, beauty and courage. Um, and uh, it's just been a delight. And um, um, just really excited to be here with you guys. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you talked a little bit about um, this uh, idea of you pasture, but you also uh, have this cafe venue. Mm -hmm. uh, can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. What, what does that do for the community and how does that help uh, sure. draw them closer to Jesus? So my vocation is I pastor this one church called Quest Church. But when people ask me, where do I pastor? I often tell them I pastor Seattle. Nice. Uh, I feel like Seattle is my larger parish and I don't do that alone. I feel like we as pastors and Christians all together, that we have to really look at neighborhood and city, that presence really to heart. And so the cafe was kind of our attempt as a church to ask the question, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? And we live in a post-Christendom world, that kind of a fancy word of saying, people just aren't going to church on their own. And so we wanted to create a space Monday through Saturday by which we could just engage in the practice of being a good neighbor. There's no, uh, there's no proselytizing, there's no four spiritual tracks anywhere, there's no secret stuff that we put in people's latte. Uh, we think being a good neighbor in itself, that, that's pretty, uh, it's countercultural, yeah. you know, and that's what we're trying, choosing to do. What kind of coffee do you serve? Oh, that's the nah, real question. Here's... Come on now, now oh, we're getting deep. Yeah, nah, this is... <laughs> Well, we serve Stumptown coffee, and okay. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it's it's always been heralded as one of the top three uh, uh, roasters in the country, wow. and uh, they're amazing, and it's good coffee. It's direct trade coffee. Uh, it's, it's a little different than fair trade. Direct trade means that we're working directly with farmers mm -hmm. so that they're able to get a bit more of the share of the whole industry, if you right. will. Yeah. Right. Um, the other thing you're, you're uh, uh, actually, I uh, wouldn't say just part of, but you kind of run and direct is the one day's wages, Yeah. Um, which I think is a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, opportunity to connect people with the heart of Christ, the body mm -hmm. of, uh, of believers. Uh, care a comment on that and, yeah. and, and how that started and how it's grown? Well, my wife and I started it about four years ago, and it's a really small grassroots humanitarian organization. Um, and what we're trying to do is to foster a culture of generosity uh, because we live in a world of so much excess to get people to think about, man, I have so much. What does it mean to, to give and to be generous, to uh, look at themselves as philanthropists, that you don't have to be a rock star or a millionaire or a celebrity. And oftentimes when people think about philanthropy, we often think about rock stars and Hollywood A-listers. And yeah. we're trying to encourage people to see themselves as philanthropists. And we want to compel them, inspire them to give at least one day's wages, 0.4% of one's annual salary. And in four years, we've been able to raise over $2 million, 100% goes to carefully vetted projects. Money can do horrible things. So we're really careful about the projects that we choose to um, to invest in the organizations that we choose to partner with. And about four years ago, my wife and I, and it's not to sound boastful, it's just that you know, we made a decision to give up a year's wages. We made that public because we wanted people to know that we weren't going to ask people to do something yeah, that, we weren't ask, that we weren't doing ourselves. And it's been encouraging. It's been arduous, but uh, it's been amazing to see how God has blessed that and the fact that it's impacting um, thousands of lives. Many would say that you are 
and I'll use the term, uh, you are a success. Okay. What, what does that term mean to you, and, and how do you view yourself? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I would like to see myself as an NBA basketball player, oh, but that, that has not come about. I've ruptured Gosh. both of my Achilles playing basketball. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I think that's an interesting question, and I love the question because I do think that is one of the most critical questions that we as followers of Christ have to ask ourselves. Or a better way to ask it is how do we define success? Um, not so much are we successful or not, because you could be successful in the eyes of some, but maybe in the kingdom of God we've been striving for the wrong thing, if you will. But I think how we define success is really important. So for me, I was a pastor at a 25,000 member church many, many years ago when I was in my 20s. And when I planted Quest Church with my wife 13 years ago, I mean, we had 10 to 20 people for the first year or so. And I really began to wrestle with the sense of uh, self-worth or value because I saw my success mm. connected directly to numbers and metrics. And while I think those things have a place on some level, when we begin to identify ourselves in totality only by those things, I think it's easy that it becomes idolatrous or becomes so tempting um, and so I understand that some people might see me in those ways. There's a few things that keep me really, really grounded. One is, and I say this not to sound uber spiritual, I taught from Philippians chapter 2 today at the Fluid Conference speaking about humility, that Jesus is humility. So I think that has to be synonymous for us to be as followers of Christ. Um, the second thing is being married, being my identity as a, as a, as a husband and a father. Uh, really impacts me and because my wife and children know me like no one else knows me and that's not meant to sound good I mean they know me yeah. they know the worst about me and the best about me uh, and they still love me and that keeps me humbled and, and the fact that I'm connected to a local church as well uh, sometimes I think you can the reality with technology today is that you could be uh, seen in a particular way out on technology and social media but I love that my local church knows me, and in similar ways, they've seen some of my best and some of my worst as well. Yeah. So seeing as your wife, I believe you said she's a, a marriage counselor. Yeah. S seeing as that's the case, uh, and you also, you're a ministry guy. Yeah. A and we all know that ministry is not necessarily 9 to 5. It's kind of like that lifestyle yeah. job. How do you balance time uh, with family, work, and play? Yeah. <laughs> You know, if my kids were here right now, if my wife was here, I would have to probably look a couple times to see how they were responding <laughs> to my answers. It's an ongoing tension. Yeah. You know, it's an ongoing tension. I was chatting with one of my daughters who's now, she's now 13. About two years ago, I uh, asked her a question that I kind of regretted after I asked it. I said, hey, Trinity, um, how can I be a better father? And, you know, the thing about kids is that they kind of tell it to you as it is. And she said, you know, Dad, um, there's three things. I mean, she, she had a list, I think, ready. She said, wow. um, I, I think you need to play more games with us. Mm. So I said, that's cool. I, I get that. I'll, I'll do that. She goes, you need to be on your phone a little less. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> Got me right there. Oh, so I put the phone away right at the moment. And the third thing she said is, you need to tell better jokes. And uh, I... Um, uh, sent her to a room after she said that because that, that upset me a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, it's a constant tension and I think I have to be really be mindful of those things. Um, the biggest prayer for me and being a 43-year-old man now and kids are aging, my oldest daughter is two and a half years away from college, Bro. is presence, is, is really striving to be fully present in that moment. And that's hard to do sometimes with ministry because you have this or this, yeah. different thoughts in your mind, but I've chosen to say, and sometimes I do well, sometimes I don't do well, but when I'm having dinner, to be fully present in that meal, when I'm hanging out and play games with the kids, when I crush them in Monopoly, Come to on. be fully present in Come crushing on. them. Um, and, and that's been, you know, a joy, and at times it's been a task. And I would be lying if I said it's always, I'm always on, that I'm always doing that well. Uh, but I've identified that's the biggest challenge for me, uh, is to be fully present in my marriage and as a father. Well said, man. Well yeah. said.
Um, when looking at this young adult generation, and, and you mentioned that your uh, your eldest daughter is uh, mm -hmm. a little over two years away from that, mm -hmm. um, what is, I don't know if it's the same uh, where you're at, but in uh, generally in the North American context, and we've noticed this in Canada, that young adult population, it tends to be the least connected uh, to the body of Christ, to following Jesus, to the local church. Yeah. Uh, do you see that? And if so, how? what do you think the challenge is? Yeah. How do we fix it? Yeah. I mean, uh, yes and no. I mean, there's constant conversations, there's articles written about the subject that a lot of these so-called millennials and young adults are leaving the church. Yeah. And, you know, um, it's hard to refute that, but I think it might, in my opinion, it's probably not as bad as we sometimes like mm. to make a sound. We tend right. to be extremists yeah. in our descriptions. We want to call out fire and maybe it's not as bad as we think it is. Um, but I do know that there are people who have really struggled with organized religion as a whole. And whether we like to admit it or not, churches are part of organized religion in some way or the other. And I think a couple things that, I, that come to my mind is I like to tell people that we need to just be really realistic about explaining that churches are far from perfect. Uh, we have a lot of young adults at our church, yeah. people that are getting married, and one of my biggest responsibilities as a pastor is to tell them, man, you're going to have a hard time in marriage. That we have to be realistic about life as a whole, and sometimes I think we have this image that church and fellowship is this amazing, beautiful thing, and while Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47 gives us that picture and mm -hmm. image, but if you keep on reading through the book of Acts, you realize that they also experienced struggles, fights, tension. And so that's one, is to give people an honest story. Uh, uh, the second thing that I would say is that I think at some point we can focus so much on the negatives that we forget the positives. I agree with that. And we, we all know the churches are broken, it's messed up. We know that leaders can be broken and messed up. But if we're only focusing on negative things, and you're gonna find negative things, and that'll dominate the way that we think. The danger about cynicism is that when you're hanging around other cynics only, it only festers more cynicism. I'm not saying that cynics and cynicism doesn't have a place in the church, but we have to also make sure what other voices are speaking into our lives that inform the bigger story of how we assess that. Um, so that's, those are a couple of thoughts that come to my mind. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, this is part, probably my uh, favorite part of the uh, interview. Yep. Uh, we're heading to our rapid fire segment. Okay. This is a chance where I get to kind of drill you on a couple things and got it. see where you're at. You've got one, maybe two seconds to answer. Okay. Seahawks. Wrong answer. Okay. Make the leaps. All right. Okay. No. Okay. We're not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> Superman or Spider Man? Superman. Done. Wow. Wendy's or McDonald's? Wendy's. Cardigan or tea? Cardigan. Mm. Hipsters or b-boys? <laughs> b-boys. Yes. Olympics. Single luge or double? Oh, single luge. Mustache or beard? Hmm. Come on, brother. Yeah. Let me hear it. Yeah. Let me hear it. We are the beard generation. Yes, That's right. That's right. Good answer. Breaking Bad's Walter White or Game of Thrones' Joffrey Baratheon? Uh, I've not seen the latter, so I'll say uh, Breaking Bad, very, very depraved, yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't know if that's bad or good. Yeah. Blackberry or iPhone? Uh, I use Android. Ooh. Okay, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift. Wow, Taylor Swift. Facebook or Twitter? Twitter. Starbucks or Tim Hortons? Tim Hortons. Yes. Bible question. Yes. ESV or NLT? Hmm, I'll go NLT. Okay, fair enough. Now, last question, serious yeah. question, we yeah. wrap up with this. What is your hope for this generation? That's a great question, and I will say, man, to go from Tim Horton question Come on to, now. To, to that. On the spot, uh, yeah. on the spot. You know, so, um, I'm gonna do a little plugging here, if I yeah, can. So I, I just turned in my final manuscript for uh, my first book called Overrated. Awesome. And it's a, a profession, a, a self-confession, but it's also an assessment of our larger generation. It's not just for young adults, mm. but 
The tagline for the book is, are we more in love with the idea of changing the world than actually changing the world? And my hope for young adults today would be the same hope for others, is that we're not just enamored by the idea of following Jesus, Mm -hmm. the idea of discipleship. And I think in our world today of some narcissism and egoism that was apparent in other generations, but more of a challenge today, I really think it's a lot tempting and easy for us to just fall in love with the idea of certain things. God's still speaking to our world today. God's still speaking to our generation, to the young adult generation, to the coming generations. And I think there is this this nuance of falling in love with the idea and then living with great courage and pursuing our convictions. That would be my hope for the young adults. Awesome. Awesome. Well said. Eugene Show on behalf of Fluid 2014 Backstage, thank you. All right. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. All All right. Awesome. Great.